Welcome to part four of our series called Sovereign. It's a study on the will of God. And I just once again want to welcome our Livingston Parish campus. I love you guys so much. And my Baker family, what's up? And uh, also everybody that's watching online. And if you're watching in the city, come on South Baton Rouge. Let's welcome all of our campuses. God bless you. We're going to have an amazing time today. We've been in this series called The Will of God, and, and I've heard so much good feedback from people who said it's helped me from a practical standpoint, but I'm telling you, today is going to bless your socks off, okay? Are you ready? Some of you are not even wearing socks, so I don't know. <laughs> Week four. All right, here we go. How many of you guys like sports? You, you like sports. You watch sports, Sports Center. Okay, just a, and you're going to be watching the Super Bowl tonight, right? Y'all going for the Seahawks or for the Patriots or... Who cares? The saints ain't in it. Doesn't matter. Not even watching it. I'm just grilling. But more specifically, how many of you guys like basketball? You like the sport of basketball? Okay. Well, God did not gift me with the ability to play basketball. And, and further in this message, I'm going to be making fun of myself a little bit more with my inability to play sports. But a few years back, a couple of guys decided that we wanted to get in shape. And, and the guys didn't want to get on the treadmill or do the Stairmaster thing. We said, we got to do something. So we decided to start playing basketball. We all showed up at the YMCA and every morning we started playing basketball and we started getting arrogant. We thought that we were very good. We, so we're getting better and better. And I had the bright idea, we got to beat somebody. We got to beat somebody at this sport. And so we challenged Bethany College, uh, which at the time was a 220i internship. We challenged them to a game of basketball. And uh, we were so confident that we were going to win, like 100%. I see people here laughing that we're in that intern class. It's pretty funny. Y'all already know where I'm going with this. So we challenged the, the intern class, and, and we said, we're so sure we're going to win. Let's just invite every single intern. Let's invite the entire Bethany staff so they can witness this whooping. <laughs> and so they all came together, and we started playing. And the thing that we did, did not take for account was our age. And by about halftime, we were about to die. I mean, we were breathing so heavy, couldn't make it down the court. And those guys, they weren't really that good at basketball, but they could run. They were all in shape, and they just ran circles around us, and they beat us. And one of the guys on our staff almost died. He played so hard. I'm serious. He was over, you know. So we got humbled. We learned, our, our, we learned our lesson. The next day, we weren't at the gym. We haven't been back. <laughs> totally demoralized, totally defeated. But in retrospect, the reason why we lost, there were actually many reasons why we lost, but the, the ones that stick out to me were this, is that we, we didn't play certain positions. And in basketball, you got five players, and each person plays a position, and everybody knows their place. Well, we all just did the same thing. And if you all do the same thing, you lose. We just were like, hey, let's just dribble the ball and shoot. That's our strategy. Dribble, shoot, dribble, shoot. And, and, and so we all did the same thing. The other reason why we lost is because about one or two of the guys would run down the court to play defense. The other three would stay in the back of the court and just breathe real heavy. <gasps> so it was about five on two down there on their end, and, 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 and that's why we lost. And a lot of times that looks like the church. It looks like the kingdom of God. The reason why we are not victorious, and the reason why we don't see the kingdom expand as fast as it could is because we have people that don't know their place, and they don't know their role. They don't know the call of God on their life, that God has an assignment for them, and so they don't play their role, and because of that, the whole team suffers. And the other thing that looks like the kingdom of God is that a lot of times we have a lot of people staying in the backcourt because their life is so chaotic. I mean, life is going 100 miles an hour and they're just wore out and they can't even think about the kingdom of God in life. <gasps> they're just doing this, just trying to stay up. And so we have some people that are expanding the kingdom of God, kingdom minded, trying to see God's kingdom advanced here in the, in the world. And then others that are just hanging back. And my attempt today is to get everybody to know their place in the kingdom of God, to know God's will, their assignment, and then to get you engaged and activated in that assignment. One of the worst things that you can get is a head cold. Amen, Amen to that. 
Head colds are horrible. I had one about two weeks ago, headache. My nose was stopped, but that's not unfamiliar to me because I inherited those genetics from my mom, uh, just a, a sinus allergy. You know, every time springtime comes around, my nose stops working. And so I knock like this, and, and <laughs> when I sing, it's like, dance sings my soul, my say. You know, it's, it's not good. It's not good when a part of the body is not functioning. And when my nose doesn't work, my wife will say, baby, do you smell that? And I'm like, nope. <laughs> I can keep living, but man, God designed our noses to work. But when you start talking about more parts of the body that stop functioning and stop doing their part, then the body begins to limp and it really starts to become ineffective. You might be a nose. And the question is, is are you working? Are you fulfilling your function in the kingdom of God? You know, you watch an ant colony. And every one of them, doom, 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 just, just go into town. You never see an ant that kind of just lays back and chills out and watches everybody else. And you don't see that. Everybody knows their place. Everybody's doing their part. And in the kingdom of God, the body of Christ, you have an assignment. Amen? Amen. Slap somebody and say, you have an assignment. All right. Let's start with two scriptures. The first scripture, this is the words of Jesus Christ as seen in red from the book of John chapter nine. We must quickly, say quickly, quickly. carry out the tasks assigned us by the one who sent us. God sent you, he's assigned you. We must quickly carry out the tasks that he's assigned us. In other words, he's put us on mission. The night is coming and then nobody can work. Now let's look in Colossians, and this is the fourth chapter of Colossians. This is Paul's letter to the church there in Colossae, and he talks to a guy. He calls out a guy named Archippus. I mean, he, in the middle of his letter, he just calls out this dude named Archippus and say to Archippus, be sure to carry out the ministry the Lord gave you. Now, in that context, this is what would happen. The church at Colossae got this letter from Paul, and the leader of the church would stand up in front of the church and would read this letter to, his, to that people. Now imagine if you were Archippus and you're sitting out in that, in, in that room and you're hearing this letter from Paul and you're like, man, this is a good letter, Paul. This is great. And all of a sudden you hear your name. Say to Archippus, fulfill your ministry. There's somebody sitting out there, somebody sitting at another campus, somebody sitting watching online, and God is putting his finger at you and saying, say to you, fulfill your ministry, fulfill your assignment. So I read that again and say to Archippus, be sure to carry out the ministry the Lord gave you. I believe God has given you a ministry. He's given you an assignment. So I'm going to give you the three ways to identify the assignment that God has placed on your life. Because a lot of people, if they knew the assignment, they would do it. But they just don't know the assignment, and so they just hang back. But today, I believe that God's going to show you where your assignment is. My first thought, if you're following along your outline, and we're going to look at God's will, and we're going to be able to tell, see God's will in your intentional design. See God's will in your intentional design. One of the greatest relationships that we can have with God, although God the Father is a great relationship. God our Savior, that's a great relationship. God our friend, that's a great relationship. God our judge, that's a great relationship. But one of the greatest relationships with God that I've come to enjoy as a believer is my relationship with him as my creator. God my creator, my designer. You know, you didn't invent yourself. You didn't come up with yourself. You just happened to be. But God did create you. You are his masterpiece. He designed you intentionally, every part of you, for a purpose. Say intentional. intentional. It's an intentional design. Now, if I make a hammer and I try to go screw something in like a Phillips head screwdriver. It's not going to work because it's not what I intended for it. But I intended 
this, and I designed it to accomplish a purpose. God designed you on purpose. Everything about you is designed on purpose. Psalm chapter 139 says, for you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I know you may think biology did, genetics did, that you're a, you're a hey, nature did this, but I believe God's hand sovereignly crafts people. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. So God did design you. Let's talk about aspects of your design that are intentional. I believe your gender is intentional. God didn't mess up. He didn't, it wasn't accidental. He made you what he wanted. I didn't choose boy or girl for myself. I just, I'm a man. And you know, and I recognize that he is the creator. I'm the clay. He's the potter. He designed me and I begin to live for his glory because he is my creator. And I I recognize my assignment and I can see his will in my gender. You know, my wife and I, uh, we're a team. We're, and our team is called a family. Our goal is to raise a great family and have a bunch of girls. I think that's my assignment on our lives is to just create girls. But we're a team, and, you know, right now she's expecting. And, and I'm not mad because I'm not carrying the child. That's not how God designed me. As a matter of fact, I'm very grateful, <laughs> very grateful for that. But so she's carrying this child, and she plays that part in our team. God designed her a way, and he designed me a way, and we're a team. I, I, I can't do it all. I can only do my part. You know, the other day I was in the kitchen and uh, Angie was cooking and she was trying to reach something on a high shelf to get. And finally she got frustrated. She said, baby, I need your height. Come over here and get this. And I was able to easily step over there and grab that dish because God designed me tall. And then, you know, another time that I'm able to play my role in the family is when Angie's coming home from the grocery store. She'll text me about three minutes out and say, hey, I'm about to pull up. And you know what that means. I need somebody to come get all these groceries and bring them in the house. But I'm cool with that because she knows that I'm the one trip wonder. I don't care how many groceries, you can feel that whole back thing. I, it only gonna take me one trip. Come on, man, y'all know what I'm talking about. One trip. I pride myself. I mean, bags may be breaking and stuff, but it's only going to take me one trip. I thread my arm through all of those uh, bags, and I thread this arm through, and I just carry them in. I'm like, ah, 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 I am, man. I can carry all these bags. But we're a team. I believe your gender is intentional. God did not mess up. And when you relate to him as your creator and realize he made what he wanted, then you start living for his glory. You start giving him what he designed you to be. And you start to see his will in your gender. But you also see his will in your ethnicity. God didn't mess up making you the shade that he made you. Everything about your ethnicity is intentional. Where you come from, your family, all of that stuff. God has an assignment for you that's going to use that. So don't wish you were something else. Don't wish you could trade colors or trade shades or, or anything else. There's nothing more concerning to me than somebody not being okay with who God created them and fashioned them to be. He's your creator. Just say, okay, I'm going to live for your glory. And guess what? That God is going to use you to reach certain people that nobody else could reach. And so you are fearfully and wonderfully made, not just your ethnicity, but also your person, which means your features and your personality. There's a girl named Amy Carmichael who was an Irish-born missionary, and she was born in the early 1900s. All of her friends were born with blonde hair and blue eyes. And in Ireland at the time, that was just the norm. And she felt odd because she was born with brown eyes and a dark complexion. And she would pray every night, God, give me blue eyes. And how many of you know God doesn't answer those kind of prayers? You know, we've all prayed stupid prayers like that, and it just doesn't happen. You know, God's like, I didn't mess up. I made you how I wanted. So she had brown eyes, dark complexion, and she didn't know the purpose for her design. But one day, a missionary, Hudson Taylor, 
missionary to China, came in and preached on missions. And she was so moved that she decided to move to India to become a missionary. Well, the people that moved with her were blonde hair and blue eyes, and they had a problem connecting with the culture there in India. But for some reason, she looked like all the other people and was able to be very effective in ministry because there was an assignment, and God made what he made on purpose. And so there is a purpose behind your big nose or your big ears or your whatever you don't like about yourself. I believe that God has a purpose for it, everything that he designed. Amen? You know, I'm just picking on you. Nobody in here has big noses or big ears. So God's assignment is intentional. The second thing is that you need to know about God is will. See God's will in your intentional placement. Placement. I believe that God strategically chooses where we're going to live, when we're going to be born, to who we're going to be born, and he places you, and that's a signal of his will for your life. Let's look at some of those aspects. Where you were born. I was born in woman's hospital right there on Airline Highway, and I'm still here in Baton Rouge, and I love Baton Rouge. I believe God made me a member or a part of Baton Rouge because he saw that I was going to impact this city. Amen. I was put here intentionally. I love the smell of Exxon when I drive past the governor's <laughs> mansion curb. I love the LSU Tigers, the Southern Jaguars. I love the culture here. I love the food here. I love everything about this city. God placed me where he placed me because I am going to impact this city. You are too. He placed you here for a reason. He placed you in the neighborhood you're in to impact that neighborhood. But not just that, but uh, he also planned what time you would be born. I'm so thankful that I'm alive in the 21st century with air condition and with, with all the nice things that we have. I mean, you could have been born in 1600, but you were born now. Come on, somebody give God thanks for that. It's not heaven, but it's close. <laughs> Thank God for it. But we were also born to the family we were born. You know, you might not like your family. I don't like, you know, the Smiths, the Robertsons, whatever you were born, but God placed you there on purpose. So you begin to see God's will. What am I trying to say by that? You need to start seeing where you are as God placing you there for the sake of the kingdom. Your neighborhood is on purpose. Your job is on purpose. Your family is on purpose. The way you look is on purpose. Everything that God does is not accidental. It's on purpose. And I know that we are so short-sighted and we don't see that stuff, but you are on purpose. And you're going to accomplish great things for God. Would you tell somebody that you're going to accomplish great things for God? Thank you all for helping me preach this morning. The book of Jeremiah, chapter 1 says this, the Lord gave me this message. I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Man, isn't that an awesome thought? Before God formed us in our mother's womb, he knew us. And he said, before you were born, I set you apart. In other words, he chose what we were going to do, where we were going to be. He sets us apart for certain things and he appointed us. And then this deals with our vocation as my prophet to the nations. Say vocation. vocation. Not vacation. Vocation. God intended your vocation for his glory. Vocation comes from the Latin word, which means calling. So when you say, what vocation am I going to go into? What you're really saying is, what calling am I going to move into? And I believe that God wants to use your vocation for his glory. I'm going to give you four thoughts about vocation that are wrong. And then we're going to talk about a right perspective about your vocation. One perspective of vocation is this. Vocation is what I have to do to get money so I can live my life. What a bad, bad perspective of your vocation. You don't want to live the rest of your life just doing a vocation so you can get money to live your life. I'm going to tell you guys, I love doing what I do. I love writing music. I love doing worship. I love pastoring. I love that stuff. And I would do it if there was not a penny anywhere involved. I'd have to pray, Lord, give me some manna from heaven or something. But, but I love what I do. And so you don't want to be working just so you can get money. 
Now, I know some of we got to get a job just so we can put the, pay, pay the bills, but I promise in the long run, you want a bigger purpose for your vocation. The second improper thought is it is why I live. Your vocation is not why you live. That's called being a workaholic. It's, it, it consumes you, which leads me to the next thought, which is it is my identity. No, your vocation does not define who you are. The fourth improper viewpoint of your vocation is it has no kingdom purpose. Everything I do for God is outside of my vocation. That's a wrong view. Some people actually think that in order to do something for God, they have to be clocked out of work and then they do something for God. In other words, I work my 40 hours a week and then I put that aside and then if I have any time, I'll do something for God. God wants those 40 hours. What God wants is for while you're there to have a perspective shift that what I'm doing right now is for the glory of God. I am a nurse for the glory of God. I am a banker for the glory of God. I'm a lawyer for the glory of God. I'm an engineer for the glory of God. I am a teacher for the glory of God. I work at Dow for the glory of God. I work at Exxon for the glory of God. Come on, you got to start seeing your vocation as your calling. And I am here to conquer. I am here to see the kingdom of God advanced. So stop saying, well, I don't have any time to serve on the A team. Let's flip that. If you do your vocation as unto God and for his glory, you are on the A team. You are a part of the A team because you are doing what God has given you for the glory of God. What is the proper view of your vocation? God has given my vocation to provide for the needs of my family. That is true and elementary. Influence the lost with the gospel. Think about that. God placed you at that job to influence the lost for the gospel. And then also to impact the kingdom with generosity. When you would start to realize that, I know you're making resources right now. But if you would ever tap into that God wants to use you as a channel to expand the kingdom of God by planting churches and by planting orphanages or by doing things for the kingdom of God, and you start becoming a channel, you're going to start to see increase in your life. It's called the law of increase. It's just a principle that works. As you become a channel of blessing and generosity, God begins to expand you. That's the proper view of vocation. Now, point number three, see God's will in your intentional gifting, in your intentional gifting. Now comes the part where I pick on myself a little bit. I've never been gifted at athletics. For some reason, I'm just not that coordinated. Um, when I was little, I watched a, a video called Pistol Pete. And Pistol Pete Maravich played for the LSU Tigers and was an amazing basketball player. And this video came out where he would hold the basketball in his bedroom at night and he'd go fingertip control, backspin, follow through, and he'd catch it. And he'd do that over and over all night long. Well, when I was little, I said, I want to be Pistol Pete. That's my calling to be Pistol Pete. So I got a basketball and I lay in bed at night, fingertip control, backspin, follow through. And that ball would just hit me in the head. <laughs> I didn't even have the coordination to catch it. That wasn't God's gifting for my life. As I grew up, I started to realize that, you know, when we would play sports and they were picking teams, they'd pick different ones and I'd still be standing there. Pick me? Oh, man. Because that wasn't my gifting. But music, I, could, I can see music. You can play a note. I am not even look at it. I can tell you what note you're playing. I can't even understand how people don't understand music. It's that ingrained in me. I just understand music. And I'm not mad at God for not help, letting me play in the NBA. I'd probably be making a lot more money if I was playing in the NBA. But, you know, God didn't craft me to play in the NBA or the NFL. Maybe the PGA. But I didn't spend enough time practicing. But God created me to do what I do. He didn't create me to draw. When I draw... It's like a stick man. I, I mean, I try to draw the most beautiful face, and it's like a little smiley face, like an emoticon or something. <laughs> if anybody can relate to that, you just cannot draw. And, and there are some people that can't understand why you can't draw. They just get it. 
This is called the natural gifting that shows you what you're supposed to be doing. What are you good at? God wants that for his glory. It's intentional for his kingdom. It's intentional for his glory. That's why I write songs that impact the kingdom of God. I could write love songs. I used to write love songs. I sang them all to Angie, but, but now I write kingdom songs. I still write love songs every once in a while but I write kingdom songs. And and God wants to use your gifting for the kingdom of God. Let's read some giftings in Romans chapter 12 because this is gonna nail everybody that's here. In his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. Now you can't do it all. I wish God had given me every gift, but he didn't because I need you and you need me. God gives us certain gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. Now that's a spiritual gift. In a moment, I'm gonna get more into that. But do y'all know all that, all know that person that just loves to pray for hours and they, they pray in the mornings, they pray at night. They just are, they're just more spiritual than everybody else. Chances are this is their gift. It's just a, a spiritual gift gift, the gift of prophecy. I'll get in more into that in just a second. Let's keep moving. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. There are certain people that have the gift of hospitality that they can put on a party like no other. I mean, you show up at their house and Thanksgiving's better at their house than the other person's house, you know? I mean, their turkey is better. The whole setting is better. They just love hospitality. They love having people into their home. They love serving people. We have an amazing A-team that serves here in the house and all of our A-team and all of our campuses. Think about the guys that set up that Livingston Parish campus every week with that heart of servanthood and that and the North, but the the Baker campus, man, the A-team up there is unbelievable. Here at our South campus, when y'all walked in today, there were people out there greeting, smiling ear to ear, welcoming, so hospitable. That's the gift of servanthood. And if you have that gift, then you need to do, use it for the glory of God. How many of you guys here, just by a show of hand at all, at all of our campuses, you love to have people in your home and you love to throw a party and you love being hospitable and you love to serve? Come on, let me see. Look at that. Isn't that awesome? Man, God wants to use that for his glory. What's bad is when you love to have parties and your spouse doesn't. That's, that's bad. All right, let's keep moving on. If you are a teacher, teach well. You know, one of the top vocations in our city, number two, is teachers. How many teachers do we have in the house? You're a teacher, school teacher, uh, pre-K, kindergarten. Come on, lift it up high. I want to honor you. I want to honor you. Okay, you teach. That is so awesome. Teach for the glory of God, but not just on the outside of the church and in, in your school Teach in the house of God. Teachers, people that have the gift of teaching, love to take complicated things and make them simple. Love to help people. Our Cultivate classes, we have amazing teachers that love to take people that are just new in the faith and see them raised up or see people that have... Uh, problems with their kids. They teach them how to raise kids or teach them about family or teach them about finances. So if you're a teacher, teach well. Then, then it continues. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. Barnabas in the Bible was an encourager. He just encouraged people. He brought people along and encouraged them. Right before this service, a lady approached me and she said, pastor, I just want to encourage you. And she started to encourage me, and I received her encouragement. And I said, I'm going to be talking about you today because you have the gift of encouragement. Encourage, an encourager is somebody that sees the best in people, and they bring it out. It's not a, somebody that's a flatterer. We don't need people walking around lying to everybody. What we do need, though, is people that see the best in somebody's future and begin to call it out. Man, God has a great plan for your life. You're doing awesome. You're amazing. You're a great dad. You're a great mom. You're a great... And an encourager brings the best out of people. We need you. Encouragers, encourage. I encourage you to encourage. <laughs> encourage people and, and, and do it. You know, if I, I don't know if Brother Roy is at our North Campus, but he is an encourager. That's one of his gifts is an exhorter. Encouragement. My friend, Pastor Jude Fuquay, he's one of the greatest encouragers I've ever met. You know, he gets, you get around him and you start feeling like, hey, hey, I'm doing good. Yeah, I'm doing good. And that's the gift of an encourager. Let's keep going. If it is giving, give generously. Now let's talk here. I want to bring some honor to this gift because a lot of times in the kingdom of God, people say, unless you're like 
leading a B group or unless you're serving on the A team, you're not doing anything for God. And I want to tell you that if you are a business person and you've given your business to God and your vocation, you see it as a calling, I believe that if God blesses you, there's a good chance you have the gift of giving. The gift of giving is the ability to give to see God's kingdom expanded. We're going to accomplish the goal. But if we have people that have the gift of giving, obedient to that call, we're going to accomplish it a lot faster. There are churches to be planted. There are campuses to be built, to be bought. There's all kind of things that the kingdom needs to move forward. And we need people with the gift of giving to recognize, hey, my gift is giving. I'm blessed to be a blessing. I'm going to give you a testimony. There's a guy in our church that I've become very good friends with. He's, he's such a dear man. And he's very successful in business, but he's also very passionate about the kingdom of God. And a few years ago, he was so passionate about the kingdom of God that he wanted to lay aside his business and go full-time into ministry. Thank God for the wisdom of God that stopped him from that. And he was able to make the switch in his mindset to see that his business was his ministry. And he began to pray. God began to give him wisdom. And, and God began to send resources, that unbelievable amount of resources. So he said, I want to plant a church. It cost $100,000 to plant a church in Mexico. And he gave the money to plant that church in Mexico, all of it, 100% of it. He flew down there for the launch of that service, and we had several hundred people show up to the first service there in Mexico. Now it's close to 2,000 people that attend that local church. And he and his wife go down there, and they see that church and weep because they can't believe how God has used them to see that work established there. That's the gift of giving put into practice. Let me give you another example. There was a gentleman that was in our church, and uh, this was when my father was still the pastor, and he gave a vision to the church. He said, I'd love to sponsor a Reinhard Bonnke crusade. And in these Reinhard Bonnke crusades, you can have between 1 million and 5 million conversions in each one. And so we called and asked how much it would cost. And they said, right at a million dollars, 950,000, I believe it was. And, and one week, my dad just said that passing in a service, and a man that was sitting in the audience got a vision. He said, I'd love to be able to pay for a crusade. He told God, if you give me the money, I'm going to pay for a crusade. Well, about a week later, he got a bonus. It was his first bonus from this new, new job that he had taken. It was a $1 million bonus. $1 million. Now, I know what you would do. <laughs> Build a house, buy a car, give my mama something, you know. But he made the connection. God's blessed me to be a blessing. And so when that guy said, who should we write the check to? He said, write it out to Christ for All Nations Ministry. We were able to sponsor that crusade close to 1.5 million decisions for Christ in Agoja. We flew there. We were able to be a part of that. It was unbelievable. And he sat there on the stage and wept as he saw those people give their hearts to Jesus. Now, I just want to, I want to challenge you guys. Some of you are trying to find your place in the kingdom. You're like, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. But you're successful at business. You need to start connecting your vocation with your calling and start being prosperous for the sake of the kingdom of God. Let's see his kingdom advanced at a rapid pace. Amen. The next gift, if God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. In other words, if you constantly look around and people just follow what you do. My youth pastor growing up, he could give the worst idea and everybody wanted to do it because it was his idea. That's called the gift of leadership. It's just people want to follow you. If you got that gift, you need to be using it for the kingdom of God. I would encourage you to be a B group leader. Say, pursue that. Pursue leadership so you can pull people together and encourage their faith. And God wants to use your leadership ability for his glory. And I want to say some of you don't, you are a leader and you don't see that about yourself. And I want to call that out of you and say, God's got leadership on the inside of you that he wants to use for his kingdom. Let's look at the next thought. And if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. That's the gift of mercy. The story that Jesus told about the Good Samaritan, where the priest passed by and the, the Levite passed by, but then the Samaritan came by and showed kindness. That's that gift of, of, of 
reaching, hurting people. I can think of people in our church that have that gift and they're so amazing at it. They find people who are in despair, people who are hurting, people on the side of the road, and they just have a gift of mercy and kindness. I want to encourage that. If you have a gift of mercy and kindness, be encouraged to use that gift for the glory of God. How do you know you have that one? Well, if you can't watch one single commercial about needy kids without giving money and you can't sit through one service, I mean, you just got a bleeding heart. That's that gift of mercy, and God wants to use that for his kingdom. Now, these are all natural giftings that we're born with. Let me tell you about some spiritual gifts, though, that we're not born with but are given to us. They're nine gifts of the Spirit as found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And the Bible tells us that we all have one. Now, some of those gifts are dormant inside of us, and some of those gifts have not been expressed, but I want to read this list because I believe that God wants to express these gifts through his church. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. A spiritual gift is given to each one of us. Say each one of us. Does that mean everybody? Yes. Come on, you guys in the back, does that mean everybody? Yes. At other campuses, does that mean everybody? Yes, a spiritual gift is given to each one of us so we can help each other. To one person, the Spirit gives the ability to give wise advice. You ever talk to somebody that's filled with the Spirit and you ask them a question and they just have wisdom? I believe my dad has that gift. It's, a, it's amazing, just a, the, the gift of wisdom. Some people think they have it and they don't. That's called a know-it-all. <laughs> to one person, the, gift, the Spirit gives the ability to give wise advice. To another, the same Spirit gives a message of special knowledge. Now, that one's pretty scary. That's like my mom. Uh, she just knew stuff that I didn't know how she knew. The, the, the special knowledge is just when the Lord shows you something that's a secret that nobody else knows, and it's, it's a gift of special knowledge. Verse 9, the same Spirit gives great faith. Now, this is such a precious gift. It's a childlike faith to just believe God for anything, to believe God for, for finances, to believe God for healing. It's just a childlike faith. I know one lady in our church that has this gift, and it is so precious. She owns a restaurant, and to me, it's one of the most beautiful gifts to see in operation. It's a childlike faith that just believes God. And to someone else, the one spirit gives the gift of healing. What an amazing gift to lay hands on the sick and see them recover. The same spirit inside of all of us, but it manifests in different ways. The gift of healing. I know several gentlemen in our church that move in the gift of healing. Verse 10, he gives one person the power to perform miracles. Now, I'll say this about this gift. I don't think I've ever seen this gift in operation in a local church. It's the gift. It's different than healing. Healing is a miracle, but the gift of miracles, when Jesus separated the five loaves and two fish and fed 5,000, that was a miracle. When he walked on water, that was a miracle. The Bible says Peter's shadow would heal the sick. That's a miracle. The handkerchiefs were taken off of the body of Paul and laid on sick people and they were healed. That's the gift of miracles. It's, it's miraculous. And the Bible says that we can ask for these gifts and pray that God would use us in these gifts, that we could yearn for these gifts. And to another, the ability to prophesy. Prophecy is, in Revelation, is to give a clear witness of Jesus, and it's also about future events. In the book of Acts, the prophet Agabus, he prophesied about a, a famine that was coming upon the land. God gave him special knowledge, and also another prophet tied Paul's hands and said, if you go to Jerusalem, you're going to be a prisoner. That's the gift of prophecy. We need that gift. He gives someone else the ability to discern whether a message is from the Spirit of God or from another spirit. Still another person is given the ability to speak in unknown languages. You know, there's a testimony I heard of a, of a man we were, uh, that was in a service, and he was worshiping God, and somebody that wasn't a believer that was from Nigeria walked into the back of the room and was just standing there, and this man started to 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 sing in another language, and he didn't realize it, but he was singing in this, this, this lost person's native tongue. And the guy walked up to him, and he said, how did you know my language? He said, I don't know any language. I'm from America. I just know English. But God was speaking through him a different language. Talk about an amazing manifestation of the Spirit of God. But then it also says, while another is given the ability to interpret what is being said. Now, when you start saying... Uh, what does a healthy church look like? It's when every person knows their gift and they're using it for the glory of God. 
when everybody knows their gifting, their spiritual gifting and, its, and expression. And I truly wish, at one point, I prayed God to give them all of them to me. I said, God, just give them all to me. But God in his sovereignty and his wisdom doesn't do that because he wants each person to rely on one another and for us to need one another. So what am I saying to you? You need to fulfill your ministry. Archippus, fulfill your ministry. Find it what that thing is that God wants you to do and start using it for his glory. Now, I want us to pray for the gifts of the Spirit of God to operate in our lives. By showing of hands, how many of you guys wish that one of those gifts would manifest through you? Isn't that awesome? Yeah. Everybody, it should be all of us. We desire that those gifts, and we're going to ask for it. We're also going to ask that God would help to shine the light on our specific giftings. Some of you should already know those giftings because when I was talking about it, you were like, yeah, that's me. And we're going to begin to use that for the glory of God. Could we all stand together, please? You guys have been so great today. I know I preached longer than normal. I was sitting there thinking, man, he preached long today. But it was necessary because you need to know your place. You need to fulfill your calling, fulfill your assignment. Now I'm going to lead us in a prayer of activation. I'm going to ask God to release us into our giftings. Would you just take a moment and lift up your hands to God? All of our campuses, lift up your hands to God. Holy Spirit, you've witnessed what I've said. What I've said is from your, from your word. You are one spirit, but you express yourself through us all differently. I'm so thankful for the body of Christ, the body of believers. Holy Spirit, I ask you right now for every person who's hungry, for every person that desires the gifts, I pray that you would give it to them right now. Lord, I pray that it would begin to manifest through their lives. Now, as I call out these different gifts, is there's one, if there's one that you desire, just tell the Holy Spirit that you would like it. The Bible says that we should ask God who gives freely, who gives liberally. What child who asks for a fish, will he give a stone? Or ask for a piece of bread, will he give a snake? God wants to give us good gifts. So let's ask. Father, right now, I ask you for the word of wisdom. God, uh, the Spirit of God in the word of wisdom to come to your people. I pray right now for the word of knowledge. God, I pray for people to receive the word of knowledge. God, I also pray for the gift of faith, the ability to believe for supernatural things, a childlike faith. God, I thank you that doubt is gone and childlike faith is, is in our hearts. God, give people the gift of faith. I pray for the gift of healing. Lord, let us begin to see people move in the gift of healing, praying for the sick to see them recover. God, I pray for the working of miracles to take place in our midst. God, I pray that certain individuals, that you would bless us, God, with the gift of miracles. I also pray, God, for, the, for, for, for prophecy. I pray you would speak to people's hearts about the future and about things that are coming. God, we would not just, we're not just live day to day, but God, we would see a greater picture. Father, I pray for the, for the, for the discernment of spirits, ability to, 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 to choose what is right and what is wrong, the discernment of, of, of different spirits. God, I pray for the gift of unknown own languages. Father, I pray people in, in this place and all of our campuses, God, give the gift of, of, of tongues and also, God, the interpretation of tongues. We receive the gifts and, Lord, we don't despise any one of them. We thank you for, for giving the church the gifts that we need. God, I also thank you for the intrinsic gifts that you put on the inside of us, the gift of leadership, the gift of giving, the gift of mercy, the gift of encouragement. God, I pray that those things would be activated, the gift of servanthood. I I pray it would be activated in our church. Let each person play their part. God, I pray you would help us to continue to see our, our vocation as a calling and we would begin to use it for the glory of God. Let us impact every business that we're a part of. Let us impact our city by impacting our businesses, by impacting, God, the, the schools that we're in and, and the world that we're in. Thank you, Father, for this message. We receive it with gladness. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen and amen. Come on, let's worship God. Let's celebrate. Thanks for joining us today for Bethany's weekend experience. We hope that you were encouraged and challenged during the message. If you made a decision to follow Christ, or maybe you've rededicated your life to the Lord, we want to encourage you to tell someone about it. Tell your family, a friend, and feel free to tell us about it by clicking on the Talk About It button on our homepage. 
If you need prayer for anything else, just go to our homepage and click the Request Prayer button. We'd love to have you join us or come visit one of our three campuses for a live worship experience. We hope you have a great day and we'll see you next time.